بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السادة الحضور رحب بكم في إحلى أمسيات أكاديمية نسيج والتي نتناول فيها واحدة من أبرز إفرازات تقنيات المعلومات والتي يبدو أنها ستشكل مستقبل تخصص المسائل والتعلمات نتحدث هنا عن تقنية الذكاء الاصطناعي وتطبيقاتها المختلفة مع التركيز على مجال التدريب والابتكار والنوه إلى أن هذه الندوة تأتي ضمن التعاون والشراكة بين أكاديمية نسيج ومركز مورتنسون للبرامج الدولية للمكتبات بجامعة إلينوي وأربانا تشامبين في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ونستضيف للحديث فيها كل من البروفيسور كلارا شو مديرة مركز مورتنسون والأستاذ المتميز بالمركز الخبيرة في تطوير الحلول الاستراتيجية والملائمة لتقديم خدمات مكتبات منصفة وذات صلة باحتياجات المستفيدين في المكتبات الديناميكية وذات التعددية الثقافية حيث تتم دكتور كلارا بدراسة الاحتياجات المعلوماتية للمجتمعات ذات التعدية الثقافية ومجتمعات ذات الأبعاد العالمية والتقنية أخيراً وليس آخراً وما يرتبط موضوع ندوتنا الليلة بروفيسور كلارا هي مشاركة في تطوير وإدارة مشروع ايديا انستيتيوت المعني لدراسة الذكاء الاصطناعي أيضاً نستضيف البروفيسور دانيا بلال الأستاذ المدرسة علوم المعلومات بجامعة تينيسي نوكسفيل بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية الباحثة والأكاديمية المتخصصة في مجال دراسة السلوك المعلوماتي الإنساني للمعلومات والتفاعل بين الإنسان والحاسب الآلي وتصميم تجربة المستخدم والتفاعل بين الإنسان والذكاء الاصطناعي ونظرية علم المعلومات يتركز اهتمام بروفيسور دانيا البحثي حول تفاعل وسلوك الأفراد سواء كانوا أطفالاً أو مراهقين أو بالغين مع نظم المعلومات والمنتجات وواجهات التعامل والتصميم المتمركز حول تلبية احتياجات المستفيدين من أجل تحقيق تجربة مستخدم أفضل وأكثر فعالية أخيراً تشغل بروفيسور دانيا منصب الباحث الرئيس والمطور المشارك بمشروع ايديا انستيتيوت حول الذكاء الاصطناعي Ladies and gentlemen, our honorable speakers We welcome you all to one of Nasir Academy webinars In our webinar today, which comes as a part of the successful partnership between Nasir Academy and Mortenson Center for International Library Programs at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, USA. We will focus on one of the most prominent information technologies, which it seems will form the future of library and information specialization. We are talking here about the artificial intelligence technology and its various application, mainly the field of training and innovation. We are pleased to have with us two speakers who are academic and expert in the field. Professor Clara Chu, Director of Mortenson, Distinguished Professor at Mortenson Center for International Library Programs at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Also, Dr. Clara is expert in developing appropriate and strategic solution to deliver equitable and relevant library service in culturally diverse and dynamic libraries. She studies the information needs of culturally diverse communities in the globalized and technological society. She's also co-developing developer of IDEA Institute on Artificial Intelligence. Also we are happy to have with us Professor Dania Pilal, professor at School of Information Science at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee, USA. She's a researcher, scholar, and educator in human, human information behavior, human computer interaction, user experience, and design, human artificial intelligence interaction, intelligent interaction, and information science theory. Her research focus uh, is on user information interaction and behavior, whether for children, teenagers, and adults, with information systems products and interfaces, and on user-centered design for better user engagement and experience. Last but not least, Professor Dania is a principal investigator and co-developer of IDEA Institute on Fitch Intelligence. One last announcement before I leave the virtual floor to Professor Clara and Professor Dania. As we used to do in the CJ Academy webinars, we welcome to receive all your questions and inquiries at the end of the presentation. 
written in the Q&A box, whether in English or Arabic. Please, Clara, the virtual floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdullah, for the introduction and also the opportunity to also uh, continue to do the collaboration with the Siege Academy. And so today we are very honored to participate and share our experiences. Uh, so um, now I'll turn it over to Dania, who will start the presentation. Thank you, Clara. And thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for this uh, nice introduction. And thanks to Saeed for coordinating all the technical aspects of uh, this presentation. So as Clara mentioned and Dr. Abdullah mentioned, today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and uh, as innovation uh, and training for information professionals. And this is a part actually of the IDEA Institute uh, on AI, but we won't talk just on the IDEA Institute. We're going to talk about AI, as you see in the outline. Um, we have, we're going to provide definitions of two major concepts, uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, we're going to cover examples of applications of libraries and um, talk about why AI is still slow in libraries, uh, and also uh, then move to the IDEA Institute in AI, why we did it, what we did, and how we did uh, that uh, institute. Um, and we will also cover some challenges and opportunities in implementing AI in different libraries. Uh, we will show some of the projects that the uh, cohort, which is 15 fellows who participated in the 2021 Institute, um, will show their projects uh, at the conclusion of the one week long Institute. And uh, also we cover the importance of providing equ equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, when we talk about AI and issues surrounding uh, AI in this regard, and also we talk about ethical questions in AI, then we would have time for question and answer. So I'm going to move this down. All right. So what is, I'm not going to read word by word. Uh, as I, you know, lecture in my classes, I just you know, talk, it's like a story. But here was, uh, you know, definition, artificial intelligence uh, is, it's actually, it's human intelligence that's uh, mimicked, you know, by machines, okay? Which means, what do humans do uh, in real world situations in terms of thinking, feeling, uh, discovering meaning, uh, problem solving, uh, reasoning, uh, and also learning in everyday life. We learn, for example, from experiences. We build our knowledge based on what we learn every day, whether it's a part of our everyday life, going, for example, shopping or talking to friends and learn from them or learning from, uh, you know, our formal uh, um, education uh, classes or something like that. The artificial intelligence actually tries to uh, provide digital computers or any digital devices such as robot, let's say, to do the tasks that usually humans do. Um, and uh, this, this definition uh, is from uh, um, Encyclopedia Britannica. And I, we thought it's, it's really the definition that provides more meaning than other definitions that are out there. Now, uh, some people mix machine learning with artificial intelligence. Machine learning is closely related to artificial intelligence. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are part of information science discipline. But machine learning is not the same as AI. You do need machine learning in order to have something intelligent. You need to program uh, you know, the machine, the computer, the robot, and so forth. So machine learning is an application of AI and provides uh, you know, the uh, systems with abilities, regardless of what these systems are, to learn, uh, to learn like humans learn, uh, we're not saying it's successful 100%, but this is what it is. The technology has improved dramatically over the past years. And that's why artificial intelligence now is becoming 
uh, one of the trends that's been talked about in our field, but it existed for a long time, but due to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the way it has evolved and especially now with, you know, self-driving cars and um, robots are playing chess with the human beings and, you know, and winning over human beings or beating them during the chess games. That's all because of the developments in the technology. So machine learning focus on develop, development of computer programs that needs data. You cannot do anything without the data. Okay, so you need to have the data. For example, your library collection, there is a lot of data there. You have the metadata, you have the catalog data, you have the tagging data. All of this data, you know, depending on what you want to use for artificial intelligence and what you want to do, this data is actually extracted uh, using a specific computer program or uh, code uh, like algorithm. And then it's uh, a model is developed to teach the machine uh, how to train the machine and how to solve whatever you want it to solve. Okay, so uh, artificial intelligence has been ranked uh, as one of the top trends in library and information science field by uh, the American Library Association Center for the Future of Libraries. Uh, in 2019, that was one of the things that we were researched when we, when Clara uh, Su Young Ri, who is another uh, co-principal investigator uh, on or co-investigator on this uh, idea institute, but she couldn't be with us today. We were talking, you know, about like, okay, what are the trends now? Uh, what we need to do for the, for this project that we want uh, to provide value uh, for libraries and for the uh, Association for Information Science and Technology. So in 2019, we found based on all the research that we've done that AI is, is the top. There are other ones, but AI is the top. And we were very interested in exploring AI and how it's being used in libraries and, and you know, uh, so forth. Uh, there is also an article 2020 that came out in American Libraries magazine uh, about what the future holds. That's the title. Uh, for libraries. And uh, one of the first items you will see in that article is AI um, and robots and, 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 and so forth. Uh, prior to that, uh, Ex Libraries uh, generated a, a good report um, about AI and where libraries stand in terms of leveraging AI or applying AI, what was the stat status uh, in libraries and so forth. Um, they found that 5% of research libraries, definitely in the US, this technology that's expensive, first, you know, most of the time it goes to research libraries uh, before it goes like to small, small libraries or school libraries. But at that time, they found that 5% of research libraries were leveraging AI technology and 80% of the research librarians were actually exploring how to use AI, how to use machine learning and so forth. Today, for example, you will see in the 2020 article in American Libraries magazine that uh, also there are lots of efforts by libraries to pilot the use of robots, implementing robots. So uh, in 2018, and with giving you this uh, to let you know where we are and where we're going, 2018, uh, an article also was published uh, by, uh, it's the Horizon Report, uh, Association of College and Research Libraries. It says it would take, among other things, four to five years for academic and research libraries to adopt AI. Indeed, it may take longer. Uh, so, but currently what we see, okay, uh, that many libraries have chatbots uh, of different kinds uh, and also have, uh, some of them have robots. So we are getting there. So when we talk about AI, also we need to see what kind, what kind of AI is it? Uh, because they do vary, applications vary. Uh, for example, one of those is assisted, another is augmented, and the third one is autonomous. The assisted is uh, what it does, it identifies patterns in data 
and um, it, it learns what that we did predetermined solutions are which were fed to the machine it doesn't discover it on its own okay again it's the data um, it everything is about data where is the data and uh, how do i work with that data uh, so these patterns uh, are based on predetermined solutions such as answers to specific questions to specific let's say uh, reference questions or fact finding questions in libraries what we call facts frequently asked questions that could be on the library's website most library websites today have have facts and these facts can be smarter than the static facts that we used to have uh, because they use uh, machine learning. Um, so, but the issue with this is that if an answer is in among the data, is part of that data, like there is a question and an answer, then uh, the uh, chatbot that's based on facts, for example, is going to give you the answer to that question. But if it doesn't have the answer, it's going possibly, uh, and most of the time, it's going to give you a link uh, to possibly, uh, or a phone number to contact the staff member to find the answer, okay? So this, this type of AI, although it uses machine learning, it does not use deep machine learning. And we'll tell you what that is in a minute, okay? So that's one. Uh, another one is the augmented AI, which is a higher level of the assisted AI in a way that all the data that's fed to the, the machine, okay, that's been extracted and given to the machine and, and trained, there is a model, actually, algorithm, uh, which is a computer code, to train the machine. All of these um, are given to the machine and the machine has natural language processing capabilities, which means it understands everyday language as to the extent possible. And it has learning capabilities. This one does not learn. It answer and question, okay? And reference to staff, also names are fed already of the staff. This one, on the other hand, it has learning capabilities. It uses, that's why we call deep machine learning because it learns from training, based on training. Uh, like we learn uh, similar uh, to the way we learn in everyday life, okay? So training the machine using the algorithm will help actually, will, uh, is essential for finding solutions, for answering questions, for, uh, you know, going the extra step from this. Autonomous is just letting the machine have control of everything. Uh, I know that at the University of Texas at Austin, they are going to uh, use uh, robots to go actually to, uh, to drive across campus uh, to collect books that are past due, for example, from users. So they're thinking about making it autonomous, which means it knows what to do, it controls itself, that's it, you know. But now they re rethinking that this could be semi-autonomous. So because autonomous is maybe uh, will be used in businesses and companies, but I don't think libraries uh, are ready to use totally autonomous uh, devices. Okay, so there is now uh, lots of applications for uh, in AI. For example, don't be surprised if you are uh, one day uh, in a workplace, in a grocery store even. Uh, I'm talking about the US, but it's coming to a place near you uh, soon, <laughs> hopefully, because it has been applied and I will go over that um, in a minute. That you see something like, look like this uh, pepper, uh, for example, going around and saying, hello, what can I help you with? Uh, voice digital assistance, all of us who have smartphones, uh, have voice digital assistants and digital assistants are actually the the use has increased tremendously in the past two years because of availability of smartphones in the hand of many people and digital voice assistants uh, like Alexa and for example Cortana and uh, Google Assistant and Siri uh, they do provide different languages that the user can switch to and also you can switch to male and or female and you can switch to the accent that you would like uh, 
uh, to uh, to here. Uh, so there are different options. Uh, so there are there is research in that area. Um, robots. Robots have been used in education. Uh, they've been used actually at different levels. So with kids all the way up possibly to high school in the classroom. And one of those for different for different purposes, but one of those I would like to mention is now. Now is a competitor with Pepper. And now that's, um, we call them humanoid because they, they, they look like humans, okay? Um, one of uh, the uh, studies that you may want to know about that has been done in Abu Dhabi uh, at uh, one of the Abu Dhabi primary schools, they used uh, now actually to uh, teach uh, or to revise a mathematics uh, mathematics session, uh, and they compared uh, no uh, skills uh, to uh, the skills of the uh, uh, teaching assistant, the human teaching assistant, and they found among the things that they found, and this is the link to the article, among the things that they found that the kids were so engaged, much more engaged with the robot than with the human teaching assistant. So if you want, would like to learn more, here is the link. Uh, human, uh, digital assistants are also used at home, like Alexa Home, uh, from Alexa, turn off the lights. Alexa, wake me up at seven o'clock. Alexa, call my friend, call Clara. Alexa, do this and that. So um, there is a lot of applications for digital assistants these days. Uh, here you see Pepper in uh, one of the public library systems in Virginia. It's in Roanoke, uh, Virginia, that actually teaching kids how to do uh, 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 programming, uh, computer codes, computer coding is teaching uh, computer coding. What's coming next, and it's going to take time, it, uh, is the 3D holograms. Holograms have been in place since possibly for a while, 2015, 2016, but they have improved tremendously over time. And now they're actually going to be used uh, in different capacities. Uh, as to libraries, they can be used to provide, um, they can take the shape of a human that you like because it's a projected light. And they can actually do speeches, they can do information literacy, they can present posters on your behalf. Okay, so uh, lots of things going on in, in, in this uh, technology. So what has been adopted by libraries so far? Let me move this here. Um, AI enabled user services. This is where you find the chatbots, you find live agents and chatbots and all of that combined, you know, uh, under the uh, chatbot. Uh, we will talk about some of those. Uh, AI based uh, extracting data, for example, and linking the data to provide um, uh, insights about publications, let's say, for example, or uh, linking data re uh, related to meta, uh, meta cataloging um, and so forth. So uh, Clara is going to show an example. Um, AI has been used also for decision making. An example would be um, a tracking. There are actually uh, apps uh, or software that shows what facilities are used the most and at what time in the library. Uh, for example, uh, it gives also aggregation of all the different areas in the library, uh, like, okay, room one uh, is used the most. And during, let's say, uh, this time and um, you know of the week, uh, so it allows for scheduling. Uh, so it, it helps people make decisions. By the way, businesses are using AI to screen applications. If you apply for a loan, for example, for a mortgage, uh, they can use AI, machine learning to, sc to screen applications. They can use machine learning for applications for jobs and so forth. So it's been it's it's used for uh, in different in different capacities. In terms of online catalogs, um, search and discovery. 
uh, is also uh, been empowered with AI or machine learning uh, and machine learning. And we will show also an example uh, at the University of Illinois, uh, at the Discovery Bento. Okay, so, um, so the chatbots that we talked about and the user services, uh, this is what we see now. Uh, and every day you're going to find more uh, libraries that are using chat, but for sure my um, saying about the United States, because I'm not sure to what extent these things are used in the Arab countries, but you don't have to use busy as itself. You can use specific software or build it yourself and, and, you know, and use it. Uh, busy started as, uh, you know, an Amazon digital assistant. Uh, they actually staff wants to use Alexa to train Alexa and answering questions that are routine. This way it saves times. Uh, and when librarians are not available, busy can, uh, you know, people can uh, connect to the online catalog and ask busy questions. Here is the chat right there. It introduces itself and then there is a question and answers. So what they did also, they wanted to see how accurate these answers are. Because, you know, with um, artificial intelligence, things are not going to be 100% accurate. With a human, sometimes, you know, it's not going to be 100% accurate because we do make mistakes. So they, but they actually over one year, I believe, they found that um, uh, 3,773 questions were answered, of which 88% were accurate. This is excellent. If you ask a computer scientist or someone in AI, they say this is, this is impressive. If they can answer questions accurately with 80%, you know, 88% accurately. And the topics of the conversation were over like different topics, over 1,000, um, how many clicks the chat had, you know, to other sources uh, to help users. And they also found that uh, 9 a.m. Uh, is the most popular time on a Tuesday um, in Oklahoma. This is for the University of Oklahoma libraries. And Busy is now part of um, it's hosted on a platform that provides a chatbot for higher education and it's called ivy.ai. So if you go to HTTP, uh, for example, ivy.ai, you will see what you see now here. And it gives you also all the features that are provided by the agents. Uh, what it provides, it provides allows live agents to chat back and forth. It also allows for um, the chatbot to be uh, just a chat when a, a live agent or a librarian is not available. So it does have different features. And some of these vary actually based on the social media they, they connect you to, like Twitter or uh, Facebook and all uh, and so forth. So they do have lots of features. The more features they have, the more expensive they're going to be. Another uh, one that's uh, built in, built by librarians um, and you know people who know uh, basic coding is at the University of California at Irvine. They called it Ant Answers, and it's an interactive, frequently asked questions. Okay, so here it introduces itself. It says, "Hi, I am an Ant, ant Answers." an exper experimental computer program here to answer your questions. And here's an, a, a question, for example, what does the library, when does the library open? You see these, this is machine learning. It's like you, staff know when the library opens. So it's included in the data. And then the, uh, the, the question is generated and then the answer is available because it is there, okay? But uh, also this, um, it's a part of their online catalog as well, okay? All right, so the human, uh, talking about, we talked about Noah and Pepper uh, and how they've been used, but uh, also Pepper has been used as a library assistant. Uh, what it does, among the things it does mainly, it greets people, hello, my name is Tammy, or my name, whatever you want to, to call them. You know, you can change the name. I can do this and that, I can help you, ask me a question. Oh, uh, currently, they can shelf books, they can retrieve books from the shelves, they can do the inventory of the collection, which is time consuming for humans to do. They can read books or stories 
uh, they can answer simple reference questions. And some of them, if they are trained well using deep machine learning and they have lots of data, they can also negotiate questions, like ask you a question to clarify, give you an answer, or give you, you know, guide you to relevant information. Um, here is another type of robot that has been new. It's called Libby. And you see the people here at the University of Pretoria uh, libraries. It's the first university um, that um, employs, employed robots in the library. You see how people are engaged. They're very curious to talk to the robot. We found the same thing in our institute when, when we demonstrated Pepper or Tammy. Tammy, we, it's called Tammy Pepper Knox. Oh, oh, everyone wanted to, to talk with her. Um, here is a short video of Tammy in, during our institute. And it's used for research at the University of Tennessee. And it's called Tammy Knox, uh, Pepper Knox. That's what they called her. Um, and uh, this is uh, Fang Pei Yuan, who is a doctoral student who works with that professor. His, we will show you his full image later, uh, Dr. Zhao. Actually, Dr. Zhao wants the computer, wants Pepper to, to uh, talk about the research that they are doing. And uh, I'm going to play, to play the video. Um, if you allow me, Dania, just to give some suspense on the video before you do it, I need to give an announce hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah. for all the, the honorable attendees here. Please, all questions will be received in written, please. So uh, for who uh, come late or not uh, join us from the beginning, we'll give this announcement. All your questions will be uh, answered at the end of the presentation. So please uh, write down all what you have in your mind and we will answer it at the end. Thank you. My name is Tammy Pepper Knox, but you can call me Tammy. And you hear her? I'm a social robot, which means my purpose is to interact with humans. Yes. With you. yes. OK, great. I recently joined researchers at the University of Tennessee to work on new and innovative ways to improve the quality of life for older adults. That's where I come in. My job is to communicate with the user and figure out how I can help in their daily activities. I can remind someone to take their medicine, go on walks with them, provide entertainment, such as brain games, motivate them to exercise, suggest calling friends and family members, and keep their care partners informed. I will try my best to understand people's feelings so that I can be sympathetic. My goals are to improve the quality of life for older adults by being a companion, looking out for their safety and health, and keeping them connected to friends and family. Thanks for watching. Yay. <laughs> okay. Presentation. Okay, so what Tammy actually, uh, the, the, the professor wanted to give to introduce himself. So he let Tammy do the introduction. And this is what Tammy is saying, because some of the wording may not be clear in the video. She said, hi there, my name is Tammy Pepper Knox, but you can call me Tammy. I am a social robot, which means my purpose is to interact with the humans like you. I recently joined the researchers at the University of Tennessee to work on new and innovative ways to improve the quality of life for older adults. This is for mainly for people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. What the researchers want to do is, Dr. Zhao, I'm, I'm actually part of that project, is to train the robot to attend to the needs of people with Alzheimer's dis disease. So that's where I come, I come in. My job is to communicate with the user and figure out how I can help them with daily activities. I can remind someone to take their medicine, go on walks with them, provide entertainment such as play games with them, motivate them to exercise and suggest calling friends and family. So it's a reminder and keep their care partners informed and <laughs> talk with the people who care up for them like family and so forth, how well they're doing. I will try my best to understand people's feelings so that I can be sympathetic. My goals are to improve the quality of life 
for older about, uh, adults, sorry, for older adults by being a companion. So the robot will be kind of companion, a friend that will be with the person, especially when uh, people like family members, friends can't be there 24 hours. Um, looking out for their safety and health and keeping them connected to friends and family. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Uh, this is a, remember that, you know, robotics is not perfect yet. And this is a, a project in process. So um, hopefully it will be successful. And um, we also have a video of Tammy dancing during, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Institute. Um, the link is there. So uh, if we have time, we can show you. But there are also other videos of Pepper. OK, if you uh, go to YouTube under Pepper, uh, and then you can see Pepper dancing and, you know, performing different skills and, you know, it has different abilities. So I guess now I'm going to turn uh, this over to, uh, to Clara to talk about AI adoption. Clara, it's yours. Thank you, Dania. Yeah, go ahead. So what um, we can see is that the context uh, is uh, open uh, opportunities. There's much that we can do and um, libraries can be part of this new horizon uh, using emerging technologies. However, we're finding that AI is still slowly being adopted in libraries. And what might be some of the reasons? Well, one is that uh, librarians currently don't have the expertise that's required. Um, and part of it is that um, it's not taught in every library and information science school, as well as there isn't the kind of in-depth training. There is uh, conf their conferences or maybe just short introductions, but not in-depth training for the professional development that might be needed by librarians. Uh, another concern are the social issues. The data that is being used uh, may have a certain biases. And so the, uh, the potential for AI is only as good as the data that we provided. There are also the social issues that if we share data, then there may be privacy and safety concerns. And so uh, there are individuals that may be reluctant to share their data uh, and allow for learning to take place based on the availability of broad data. There are also the challenges that people may have. They may fear losing their job or that they would need to change their job because some of the basic uh, types of activities are being conducted by uh, through machine learning or by robots. And so uh, the concern is if we maybe ignore this, um, it might go away, but that's uh, not the case. Uh, there is the evolving nature of AI, uh, even though it may have taken a long time to get here, there is the change in technologies, new ways of implementing AI. So the need to constantly be learning may be an issue. And then the last issue are the financial constraints. And so it's not uh, inexpensive to uh, be able to implement some of this AI. And so the concern is for these smaller kinds of institutions, you know, can they afford to integrate AI into their libraries? And so we've taken some of these issues into concern and the ones that we've been able to address, we are doing, and that's where our institute comes into play. Um, so our project then is addressing the lack of in-depth training. It's a one week institute. And this institute is focused on a lot of the challenges and issues that we know are critical and we also use a format to ensure that there's application that our um, fellows are very comfortable with using the technology. And to ensure that we have a particular approach to doing this work, we call the Institute the IDEA Institute. The I is for innovation because we want to have our library and information professionals really think about how is it that they could be integrating these disruptive technologies. And so disruption is what is taking place, that there are new technologies that allow us to rethink, to really reshape what it is that we have traditionally uh, been doing. And so by 
creating these disruptive technologies and being able to integrate them, then we are in a process of constantly researching, understanding how it is that we might be able to implement them. And so the uh, inquiry is an important part of the training and the approach that we use. And then lastly, we want to be able to ensure that there is access. And so the technologies that we provide are not just technologies to be able to do something that's the latest or to be able to do something that is interesting, but to ensure that not only does it enhance accessibility, but accessibility is being provided to everyone. So equitable access is a key, uh, is a key component to the way that we are integrating and teaching AI through the IDEA Institute. So our IDEA Institute is constituted of a team of experts that are not only organizing it, so that is uh, Dania, uh, myself, and then Su Young Ri at the University of Texas at Austin. And so uh, we have created and designed this particular program and with us to help us to further develop it as well as to teach some of the components. Then we have four experts and these experts are uh, contributing to the different components of the uh, IDEA Institute. So they are teaching during the week, as uh, during the Institute, as well as uh, in the design process. And so we have Nicole Coleman and Claudia Engel from Stanford University. And we have Jen Gen He from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And then we have Bill Michaud, who is from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. All of this work wouldn't have been possible without the funding uh, from the Muse Institute of Museum and Library Services, a government agency uh, in the United States. It's so with most of the funding coming from that institution, then we also work with partners to ensure that we are hearing from the professionals as well as have them support the uh, promotion of our program and the sharing of the knowledge. And so that includes the American, uh, I mean, sorry, the Association for Information Science and Technology and also the American Library Association. Next slide. And so the goals for the Institute are threefold. First, we wanted to ensure that we developed an innovative, forward-looking continuing education program on AI in library and information environments. And then not only did the program need to be innovative, then we wanted to ensure that we were developing leaders of AI in library and information environments that individually as well as collectively, they would be able to innovate and create better awareness of AI as transformative technology. And so we have the program and we have the leaders. Then last is that the curriculum that we are have developed that it fills a gap in AI education. So uh, we, uh, through the curriculum that we've developed, it will be available more broadly once the Institute is completed, uh, the uh, two uh, years that we have the funding. And then after that, the Association for Information Science and Technology will be able to use this curriculum and be able to share it in the way that it's uh, considered most appropriate. It's very important for us to have addressed all those social issues that are critical in the field and for developing AI. So first off is equity, diversity, and inclusion. As a value of the Institute, we are committed to all aspects of uh, AI in our program, uh, whether it's to deepen the knowledge and skills of AI professionals in AI, uh, but also to ensure that we are enhancing um, equitable, diverse, and inclusive and accessible information access discovery services for users. And so we are ensuring that it's broad. And so it would be not uh, focusing, but ensuring that we are addressing race, ethnicity, gender, uh, identity, sexual orientation, social economic status, and other dimensions of uh, potential inequity. And so it's very important in the design of AI that it's a human-centered approach, that we're not just trying to develop something 
because it is an easier process or it's a faster process, but it's one that addresses the needs of the users and is based on understanding the users. And we also want to mitigate any uh, algorithmic bias in the data. And so when we are teaching during the IDEA Institute, then we have the fellows uh, look at the data, where what data may be missing, how it is that they can ensure that they can identify complementary ways to uh, ensure that there isn't any bias in the data. So during the AI Institute, then we ensure that our fellows have awareness as well as they develop their literacy and they have competency. Competency is developed by actually applying their AI knowledge. So with this uh, grounding, with these three levels, then we hope that after the Institute, the fellows are able to individually and collectively uh, gain more mastery. So we're not able to ensure that everybody is an expert uh, AI developer at the end of the one week, but we are sure that they have the basic grounding to be able to develop their skills and be more masterful in applying AI. So the Institute had its first cohort last July, and we will be holding the next cohort at the University of Texas at Austin. So uh, for the Tennessee Knoxville program, then we were able to hold it uh, first as a pre-institute onboarding virtual program where we were able to address issues relating to developing programming skills, provide some context regarding statistical knowledge, as well as introduce some of the key social concerns. And then the program was held in July and we have some post-institute activities, conferences, workshops, and other and these kinds of presentations uh, after the Institute. And then we have been constantly assessing the uh, program. Of course, because we are uh, still facing the COVID-19 pandemic, then we had certain considerations. The considerations regarding safety by the Tennessee Knoxville campus, we ensured that we follow the policy. So at first we thought we wouldn't be able to hold it, but because the vaccine was made available and uh, there were certain accessibility issues uh, that we were able to follow, then uh, we were able to hold the Institute at the time that we had originally proposed. However, with regarding to distancing and safety, then instead of uh, our fellows sharing a room, then we still had them all in one particular place. So they were all had individual rooms at the hotel. So then it addressed the cohort development. We wanted the fellows to be able to interact with each other, easily find each other if they wanted to uh, talk about collaborations or teach each other something uh, regarding AI. So the cohort learning experience was made possible because it was face-to-face -face allowing those interactions to take place easily. And then we uh, didn't um, change the uh, dates. Uh, we were able to keep them, uh, but then because of these changes that we made, then we had uh, financial implications, uh, which then uh, allowed uh, the, uh, the program at Tennessee to be able to provide additional funding and uh, allow the program to take place. So we had 17 fellows in all, and as you can see from the range, they come from different organizations. 13 were from academic libraries and uh, one from a school library, and that is in the purple. And then uh, two were from a public library, and those are color-coded in green. And then one is a faculty member. And uh, as you can see that they range from uh, different institutions and uh, of the 17 fellows, 15 were funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services grant. And two of those fellows were fellows that applied and were able to self-fund themselves. So this opportunity will be available to you, which uh, Dania will share later on. And so some of the highlights from the Institute are that the fellows were able to uh, exchange their project ideas during the Institute. 
And then they were able to learn about the conceptual, technical, social, and applied aspects of AI. They were able to reflect on their learning as well as discuss areas uh, for improvement. So we were able to have assessment uh, during the Institute to allow us to make changes. And this is an important part because we want to focus on user-centered learning. Uh, they were all able to develop their own AI projects. We had a showcase where they presented their ideas uh, to the public. We also had networking di dinner with uh, AI experts who came from the University of Tennessee. And then we were able to uh, evaluate the program before, during, and then also after. So some of the curriculum topics, which some of you, if you are thinking, you know, what can I learn or how do I develop this for my library and information science program, then these are some of the topics that we covered. You know, basically what is AI? Then we also discuss the AI challenges and opportunities and uh, what impact can AI make in your libraries and what are the values and ethical concerns? We also taught uh, uh, from a user uh, a centered approach and um, how to design your project. And so project planning was critical in uh, the, the curriculum, uh, user-centered project design, data collection for AI applications. So what data is already available? There are data sets that are available and what new data does one need to collect uh, because it's needed for a particular implementation? AI and technical services, uh, and then how to prepare the data. You can collect data, but it's not uh, always ready to use. So how do you clean the data is, was also part of the curriculum. Uh, what AI tools and solutions are already available and how do you uh, review them to ensure that you are selecting the right one for your institution. Uh, machine learning and coding. And that was uh, observed through examples and then coding was applied in the last area, which is that the uh, fellows were able to program uh, voice digital assistance. Um, they were all provided with, um, an, uh, uh, with Alexa that they were able to take home and be able to implement it in their libraries. So uh, we have a few examples of AI. And so one comes from the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and they are taking legal texts and using text mining. So the question that they're posing is that, uh, can text mining and machine learning identify racist language in legal documents? So this is part of an example of how AI can convert um, and use collections as a source of data for education, reparation, and research. And another example is the newspaper navigator where they're able to explore the visual and textual content uh, within the Chronicling America digitized newspaper collection. So you can go and search this and you will be able to use it and find it and see how it works. And so one particular aspect uh, is from uh, our advisory board member, uh, Bill Michel, and he was able to present uh, to the group the uh, particular discovery model that he has developed for the University of Illinois and is available to any other institution, which is that you create a new layer to be able to do search. And this particular approach is to create a bento box. A bento box is, you might uh, be familiar with it from uh, looking at particular, uh, when you have ordered a Japanese lunch, and so it creates, uh, uh, provides content into different areas. So when you do a search, then uh, you have some suggestions. That's the first section of the bento box. Then after that, then if you look at the left column, then the first uh, box provides articles that come from uh, EBSCO. Then the next uh, box that is below are additional articles that uh, come from, uh, uh, that are from Scopus. And then in the middle section is the library catalog and uh, results from there. It gives the top 10 results that then you can click and then look at more results. And then it also provides after that uh, additional results. 
um, and that's the secondary uh, display area that you can uh, introduce. Then the third column will provide additional information such as subject su suggestions. And then the next area uh, is the blog web search results. So it also searches the web for you and provides results. And then the last box, it allows the library itself to advertise particular services that it has. So let's look at a particular um, uh, example of a search that was conducted using the Bento discovery box. So this is a search and the search was done on uh, materials discovery and machine learning. And as you can see, uh, based on the model that you just looked on the previous slide, on the left-hand side, you can see the articles that are coming through EBSCO. You can see the library catalog results on the middle. And then on the right, you can see the subject suggestions. You can see that you might want to search in computer science in uh, these other uh, 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 data resources or journal, journal article resources. So we go to the next slide and you can see um, if you scroll down, then uh, the rest of the data is presented to you. And then to the right, you will see that is the Savvy Researcher Workshops. The library it has the opportunity to promote its particular uh, wor workshop series. So I also wanted to be able to share with you another um, development that was created by Bill Michaud and his team. It's using machine learning for text uh, with topic modeling and clustering. So what he has done is taken the publications and data that's available regarding publications and research such as grants from the engineering faculty. And what you can see is uh, the uh, publications as well as the citations, the grants and so forth of the engineering faculty. So if we take the top two left examples, you can see that uh, Mark Anastasio, and he has as, about as many articles, 171, compared to uh, Rashid Bashir, and uh, Rashid has 170 articles. But if you look at the uh, citation, then uh, Mark has fewer citations, uh, close to 2,000, while Rashid has over 5,000. And then in terms of grants, then Rashid has uh, about double the number that uh, uh, Mark has. So what the University of Illinois Engineering School has been doing with this data is to be able to show the impact of their faculty, who's making impact, who is uh, creating and developing and uh, contributing to research. Um, and so this is a way to compare the faculty across uh, their discipline. So now I'll turn it over to Dania. Okay, we have a few snapshots from the Idea Institute. I know in one of the Q&A in chat, it says, okay, how do we do this? Uh, this, is, this is an example of a group uh, of, uh, of fellows during the Institute who use the Google Digital Assistant. We distributed Google Digital Assistant to everyone uh, at the Institute for free. Uh, and it was a part of the funding from the grants. And uh, they, before they started working on this, they had this session, uh, possibly two hours or so, uh, with uh, coding using uh, using Python, which is a computer language, uh, and also uh, extracting data from Google uh, uh, from Google Dialog Flow. Uh, Google Di Google has collected. You know, Google is one of the uh, major search engines in the world, so they have lots of data. So what they did, they use some all of this data and put or some of it and put it in in a specific uh, database, let's say, and it's dialogue flow where you can get like um, the way we communicate in everyday life. So in order to provide an example to uh, to the fellows. Uh, and on how, how you get data, where the data is, because they didn't have data with them from their own libraries, uh, but they need to learn how to, to program. Uh, so uh, Dr. Jingen here, 
uh, who is uh, at the School of Information Sciences at the University in, in, uh, of Tennessee and also has a strong background also in computer science uh, and AI. Uh, he provided that session about how to use Python and to grab the script, for example, uh, from dialogue flow and how to use it to create uh, those question and answers uh, for a chatbot. And here is uh, 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 all participants in the Institute, including Clara, uh, myself, uh, Pepper, <laughs> uh, Tammy Knox, and the student, and some of the fellows, and Su Young Gri. And this is Dr. Zhao, who is working with the robot uh, on the project that I told you about. And his doctoral student is part of it. This is another doctoral student of his, also uh, interested in using robotics. And we have also the faculty, the experts here, some of the experts and also some of the, uh, the fellows. Okay, uh, so uh, Clara mentioned that uh, uh, the, uh, the fellows actually in the beginning, you know, of the Institute, we asked them to think about uh, the project for your, for your uh, library, for the workplace where you are, or, you know, for your own environment, uh, professional environment. And that's what you're going to work on. And toward the end of the uh, of the institute, like on a Friday, it was a Friday, July 16, uh, they presented uh, their projects. Some projects were more advanced than others. Uh, and we do have, it's my pleasure to say that some of them have carried out the project actually, uh, like Tiana Smith, for example, this one, uh, Tisha, she called her chatbot, um, Tisha Ask Tisha. Uh, she's, she was people, uh, not by herself, but also with the help of others at Queens Library in New York, uh, public library. She wants to create a chatbot uh, for, for people who use the library about advisory, readers advisory, like giving suggestions for what to read uh, and, and, and so forth. So she's been carrying this out. It hasn't been uh, completed yet, but soon, I guess, maybe toward the end of next year, she will have it implemented. Others also have worked. If you look at the titles here, most of the, uh, you know, the uh, content uh, or the projects, most of them were focused on chatbots. Uh, some of them, like they want, this one is unique. Uh, Joy is one of the librarians at the uh, um, University of Tennessee Main Library, and she's interested in uh, using uh, linked data to connect Islamic technology with the history of robotics, uh, like who started robotics, uh, you know, during, uh, you know, um, over the history and uh, during Islamic, um, you know, specific Islamic eras. Um, so, uh, other ones include, for example, image processing, uh, immersive visualization, and virtual school library assistant, which is also, this is a G, by Gigi, who is a professor, and she wants also to create one to help with teaching because, you know, as a teaching assistant, answer questions, you know, and engage with, uh, with students. Here is one for discoveries through, through AI-assisted keyword search which is in the discovery interface of the online catalog, chatbot for digital reference, uh, and so forth. So uh, lots of interest uh, in this. So really, we're uh, glad to see all of these things, even if they are just the planning for the project, which you, should be done before you carry out the project. And we emphasize the human aspect. So we, uh, you know, provided session on the whole methodology of a human-centered design. Okay, um, related activities. So what also came out of this Idea Institute? Uh, we assist uh, Association for Information Science and Technology is the major association uh, in information science and related fields. And it has special interest groups uh, of people uh, who focus on specific aspects of information science. And, uh, but they did not have artificial one on artificial intelligence. We were very successful in creating one. And um, we also provided uh, the first workshop uh, about AI 
um, at the annual conference, at the ACES annual conference. It was a half a day workshop, four hours on October 30th. Um, and this is the logo for the SIG AI. Now they have their homepage through, through ACES. Uh, before I move further, I would like to mention that also ACES has chapters in different geographic regions of the world, but did not have a chapter in the Middle East region. Um, uh, I'm pleased to announce that I launched uh, like in the summer, uh, in June or July, in June, I believe, I or August of 2021, I took the, you know, the um, uh, initiative to launch the Middle East chapter uh, in there and, you know, for, for ACES. We would love for you to participate and uh, there will be a no membership, like paying the fee for ACES is expensive. So in order to promote the chapter, we are also providing a free membership the first year for students who are in library and information science. So their faculty uh, can uh, actually nominate, you know, send us a name of one or maximum two students that they would like uh, to be a part of, of ACES librarians who cannot afford uh, paying the membership fee, they can also contact me. Uh, just email me, dania at utk.edu. It's in the last slide. Say, I am interested in joining uh, ACES. Uh, you have to be a member of ACES to be member of the Middle East chapter or any chapter. So you can contact me if you're interested and I can give you additional information about that. Uh, some faculty who are also in developing countries like you know, in part of the Middle East who can't afford the membership, we can also sponsor um, you know, their membership the first year. So we would like for you all to be involved and I would welcome you know, your uh, ideas and so forth because it would be good to have also, I know Special Library Association is the main one in the Middle East, but also think about ACES because ACES goes beyond SLA. Um, and uh, especially with the, you know, this kind of technology, emerging technology and so forth. So uh, other one where program we have is at the uh, American Library Association. We submitted like a two session program. Uh, we're still waiting to hear if it's going to be, um, if it's going to be uh, accepted. We also provided so far different uh, talks uh, at different conferences, one in South Korea and World Conference, one in Lebanon uh, uh, for the Lebanese Library Association, one in Mexico, uh, which was in Spanish provided by Clara, and this one, which serves all the Arabian Gulf region. Uh, we also have one forthcoming at the NSC Library Association and also one about uh, at the I Conference 2022. The one at the I Conference will focus on education on the curriculum. Uh, what should the curriculum have uh, for in library and information science in order to equip uh, future, uh, for example, um, librarians or information scientists um, with the knowledge of AI? And uh, we would like to invite you to apply uh, for the 20, uh, 2022 Idea Institute that will be uh, offered at the University of uh, Texas at Austin, uh, most likely in July. If you go to idea.infosci.utk.edu, you will find the apply, uh, you know, just explore that site. Uh, um, and uh, the application, please read the, the uh, because it has some criteria for the application for, because this, the first one, uh, is for the funded one by uh, the federal agency. The second one that we will post is for those who don't meet the criteria for this one. And uh, they can apply, but they have to pay their own expenses. Okay. And we thank you very much, Shukran Jazilan, Al Al Hudur. And here is my contact. Uh, information and here is a Clara and here is a Sue Young, uh, Sue Young Gri. And now uh, we have uh, time, hopefully, for asila uh, wata saulat, hopefully, wal ajuba question and answers. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Dania. Um, actually, um, we're so happy just to have you both uh, in this uh, webinar because I think you deliver this um, very promising uh, technology in a very easy way. Uh, and as I said, that is uh, the very successful presentation is the one that raise and stimulate questions and ideas. And before we start the, receiving the question, there is many questions already comes to us. So thank you so much for this valuable and informative presentation. Let's move on directly to the question when we can start with one. I try to classify the question because some of them are uh, talking about the same issue, but let's start with this one. It's old and renewable question. Uh, does artificial intelligence uh, substitute the human, whether this is, will be in the short or long future? Um. Um. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead, Clara, go ahead. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so the answer is yes and no. Uh, so yes, it will substitute humans for basic uh, and certain kind of mid-level uh, skills or activities, but it will not uh, replace a, um, a particular uh, approaches that a human would be able to do, such as uh, you know, uh, more emotional support, uh, really understanding and following up and being able to really uh, uh, provide that kind of uh, individual knowledge and support and advanced knowledge. And so I think that people don't have to worry. Um, what we have to do is understand the technology to know how best to apply it, but not be afraid of it. Yes, and I would, I, would, I would add to that is that remember, we humans, we create the data, okay? So the data comes to us, from us. So we are, we are uh, very highly usable people and uh, the expertise comes from us in terms of you know, what we do in libraries and, and so forth. Now there are things that can be repetitive, things that are routine, uh, things that can relieve, you know, things can, that really waste uh, the professional's uh, uh, time. And these things, it's like the online catalog, you know, uh, that was about automation. And when automation became, you know, like um, a, a, the trend is that, oh, automation is going to replace me as a professional. It did not. Actually, it helped and provided more innovative ways of for the users and for the librarians to do things. Uh, it would use it, it would use repetitive stuff, routine stuff that take time, you know, and by automating them. This is a higher level, okay, but it's analogical to the automation era because here you are actually using AI, which is, you know, to do something much smarter than we used to do before. So if you embrace, we know there are lots of issues, we know there are lots of challenges. Uh, but if you embrace the idea is that, okay, how can I use this technology to improve the services that I am, I have been providing and what do I need to do to get there? Okay. Thank you, because uh, we have another question in the same wave uh, comes from uh, Bahaji, if I pronounce the name right. One of my master students did a project on mm -hmm. using chatbot in information services based on the FAQ. All participants in the study were afraid of losing their job if the library goes for robots to deliver service to user. What if the future holds for them in this era of uh, artificial intelligence in library? Also, there is a chat, uh, another question about chatbot. Can chatbot and uh, the like robots answer? Question whose answer are not part of the FAQ uh, this is, I think, also the same. So we need just, again, to give some elaboration about that. It's, from my point of view, it needs more skills, more qualification from the librarian in the future, more than afraid of the robot. But uh, I give, uh, again, the floor for you, Clara and Dania, about giving more elaboration on this, uh, mainly for the robot or the chatbot. Mm -hmm. Okay, since we started Clara? with, you know, answering it with a Clara, Clara, go ahead, then I will follow up. <laughs> okay, let's sure. put it in this way. Okay, uh, so then uh, in terms of people being afraid, 
being afraid means that you're afraid to learn. And so as a librarian, if you're not afraid to learn, then you will be doing okay. All you need to do is to uh, gain the professional development, uh, the education of the training to be able to know where your place fits in. And so I think that the worry only comes from not wanting to embrace uh, and be open to the future. Uh, the second question had to do with, uh, uh, oh, whether the, um, uh, if the answer is not in the FAQ. So I think it depends on what kind of uh, technology you're using. So if it's a straightforward, just, you know, assisted intelligence um, robot then, or chatbot, then um, it will only provide as Daniel was saying, either it will say error or it will say, please contact your library service. And so there will be some alternative to um, the FA, the question that is posed that's not answered. And, um, and uh, there will be new technologies that, uh, as Dani has said earlier, will adapt and learn and integrate uh, new questions and be able to potentially offer other kinds of solutions. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, this is uh, this is an interesting question uh, about you know the master students. Uh, okay, let me ask you this. Uh, I don't like to answer questions by asking questions, but uh, just to put things in context, why should someone who is a professional, whether they have a master's degree or have higher degree or even have a bachelor's degree in some cases, who are staff members, why should they answer the question where the bathroom is all the time? for example, or what shelf can I find this book on, okay? Uh, what actually, um, you know, robots or uh, even digital assistants, if they are programmed to do this kind of stuff, or even if people want to text, because people are texters these days and they prefer to text rather than sometimes ask questions to a human being, or if they are remote, they may text, um, they can be provided with the answer. Uh, and another thing is the time spent by professionals or whoever or other staff members, uh, regardless of their background or degree, on, on these repetitive questions that the answer is there, there is a target answer for them. It's not like a research question where you have to go through multiple steps to, to uh, guide the user uh, to uh, relevant resources. This time that's spent on repeti repetition can be used to provide better programs, better user instruction, improve databases, improve, you know, other services in the library. So this is how, this is the argument, is that with all this repetition, like, you know, um, robots can be able to check in books, okay, in the future. Um, and uh, so the humans who used to check in books, who are maybe students or so, can do something else, okay? Can do a higher level task, okay? So um, that's my answer to that one. As to the answer to the second one, um, which was, remind me what it was uh, about, about- If there's no the answer checkbook. to the FAQ. Uh, yes, if there is no answer to the FAQ, um, once the, uh, the chatbot like sends, let's say, okay, ask a librarian or contact a staff member, okay? The staff member finds this question that didn't have an answer and then provide answer uh, to it. So now you have an answer in the data and then the chatbot will update, will update that. Now, as Clara mentioned, there is a new software. There's software that goes beyond what we talked about. And that's used by research libraries. It's called, it's uh, provided by Springshare. It is expensive, but uh, it's high end. And what it does it, to collect the FA and Q, uh, the, the facts, it actually goes also to all social media aspects. If the library has social media, presence and people ask questions via Facebook or via Instagram and so forth. It actually scans all of these questions, gets the answers and include them in the chatbot to be able to, for the chatbot to answer it. So it depends really on the level that you have. 
uh, do you have a chatbot that's only facts? Okay, then it can be augmented with some of those questions, as I mentioned. Do you have one that is a chatbot and also there is a live agent available? Uh, so if the chatbot can't answer, it will tell you go to the librarian. Librarian gets the question, okay, and then answer the question. So really it depends on the on the environment uh, in which the chatbot um, is is implemented. Yeah. I hope this uh, answers you. your question. Yeah. yeah, if I just add more here, especially based on the experience. If we're talking about Nasir, because some of the attendees ask about if there is some of this technology available for Nasir, the, the mother institution. I think chatbot also, there is a, a, a product about this and there, there is a effort spent on this one on, on my dad. And uh, my uh, uh, experience in this one, it's based on how you develop this, as you said, and also mm -hmm. how humanized this chatbot it is, because this will lead to more engaged on more uh, digging in deep for the question with the uh, also one more thing through the chatbot you can answer hundreds of uh, users at the same time which is very hard to do by the librarian uh, so this is uh, just a, a quick yeah. uh, ad for sure. this one um, let's go to the next question it's uh, about from miss nadia i tried to go and uh, synchronizing thing how artificial intelligence will influ influence the academic field education what are examples for artificial intelligence in education? Mm -hmm. Okay, Clara. Clara. So, oh, okay. I think that uh, there are a couple questions that have to do, you know, how can we use AI in education or how can we use AI in libraries? And I think that um, instead of us trying to address because uh, the technology is changing and uh, that we are able to provide, you know, the perfect answer is that it can be used almost anywhere uh, as long as there is data. You can program for certain uh, things to be done based on that data. And then it can contribute to supporting education at this point. Uh, in some cases, if it's very straightforward, you know, a very basic course, then, you know, the robot can teach it. Um, so it can, um, it can support so many areas as long as the education program is willing to either hire the people to do it and buy the technology uh, or that it's uh, developed and bought in house. And then the same is the answer for the AI in academic libraries or AI in libraries. Yeah. And I think that uh, one of the concerns would be, you know, how do I know what to buy and what should I implement and am I ready for it? And I wanted to, since we also don't have too much time, I wanted to provide an example from my own university library, which is that we don't have the answers, but we have developed uh, or uh, created a working group. And that working group is exploring all sorts of things. They're trying, you know, uh, data mining, they are, uh, you know, developing um, just different solutions, linked data and so forth. And um, depending on what they're finding, then they're saying, okay, these are the flaws, these are the challenges, you know, can we continue to develop something in-house or should we buy a product? And so by the kind of um, AI literacy that is being developed by us, not being scared to try something is what I think is a good solution. Yeah, okay, I will uh, add it just. Uh, Daniel, yes, please. Yeah, I'm not going to go. Uh, you know, uh, I know uh, Clara provided uh, the answer to uh, the questions, but I would like to add is that uh, in education, for example, I give you an example of classrooms like uh, uh, robots are uh, would be great as teaching assistant to the teacher. You know, teaching assistant because teachers spend lots of time on grading grading student assignment. So uh, robots have been used as teaching assistant to do the grading, to answer student questions, uh, to guide the students on how to do their assignments. Uh, yeah, and so there are, uh, there are many different ways that they can be applied. Um, so I, again, you know, robots need to be thought about very carefully. Uh, because first they are expensive 
Second, you need to have a reason for having robots for all of this technology. Uh, you know, like, why do I need it? Um, whereas, you know, for something that's basic, like voice digital assistants and chatbots and all of that, um, these are, this is the trend. So and eventually every, every library is going to have a chatbot because you don't have a staff available 24 hours to answer user questions. Yes. Amen. Exactly. Thank you for, for raising this one because there is many questions about the cost effectiveness for using these technologies, especially in the developed countries. Uh, yes. Uh, your expectation, especially let's start this time from Dania. Uh, from your expectation, this is still far from the uh, developing country uh, in the region. Especially, I can see that there is some experience, some uh, uh, efforts in mm -hmm. this track. But how about the cost? Yes. Uh, now, um, Pepper is Pepper. As if you were using a robot, uh, the the price there is a price range depending on what do you want, which robot you want, and what do you want the, the robot to do, and what are the uh, what language comes with it, and all these you know uh, what do we call them characteristics or. Um, um, specifications. There are robots that cost five thousand dollars or four thousand, okay, or three thousand small ones. There are robots like uh, like Pepper, for example, is like twenty thousand dollars, and Nawa is like ten thousand or ten thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, and what some libraries do, for example, they apply for grants. Uh, and to have some, you know, do projects. And then part of the grant is actually having the robot. Again, if you do need to have a good reason, good rationale for having robots in your library. Uh, and I'm really glad to see some researchers in Abu Dhabi doing that kind of research. Yeah. Uh, about, in Saudi about, Arabia you know, as well, I think, and Egypt. Yeah. Yes. Uh, about using some of these robots for, you know, uh, in, in different capacities. Now, one of the things that will possibly accelerate these things is awareness. Awareness by faculty who teach in library and information science programs in, in terms of integrating some aspects of AI in their courses. Uh, because you have, you have students who hear about these things, uh, they're new students, they may not buy that idea of using, you know, this kind of technology. They may think it is disruptive and it can be disruptive. Uh, so, it, you know, you need to build a good curriculum uh, to teach the future generation about this emerging technology. And there will be more technology emerging, okay? Uh, so that's, we don't stop here. So uh, our field is based on technology developments. Okay, so it's evolving. So uh, it's 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 very challenging uh, because the technology now is driving everything, everyday life. So um, yeah, the cost really depends on again cost effectiveness. Why do I want to use it? Yeah. But for chatbots, you can build it at you know if you have the good team. It doesn't require high level coding. Uh, but you can learn like how to code in Python. You can look for the data in the library, you know, see where the data is uh, and uh, build the database for your data and then uh, design that chatbot. Thank you. And they will try to run for the question because I know that both of you have uh, engagement after our It's something related to the application of the AI on classification and indexing, uh, and also in school libraries. It's come from Mr. Muhammad Jalal. Clara? Clara, do you want to answer that? Or? Yes. Uh, OK, so in terms of classification and indexing, I'm not as familiar, but I did want to share something that is pretty straightforward. As Dania had said, um, you know, most of us can use, uh, can create the chatbot or uh, program a voice uh, assistant. And so I'm sharing on a link and um, many of you uh, might already have Amazon Echo Alexa. So I misspoke, we had used Google Assistant and not um, Amazon Echo. But uh, if you are a small library and you might be using LibraryThink to catalog, then you 
can already be asking your voice uh, assistant to be able to catalog your books. So you don't have to type in anything. And so um, a lot of all of these things are available and um, communities are being created. So apart from SIG AI as a community to learn, you, there is also ALA. ALA has what is called core uh, and you can join without uh, being a member of ALA. There are all of these interest groups now where librarians are teaching each other, they're learning together, and um, it just um, depends on how much interest you have and how much time you want to dedicate. And um, so I thought I would contribute that. Dania? Yeah, uh, there are actually, uh, in the past, they used uh, expert systems to do the cataloging and classification of collections. And it proved that expert systems failed somehow. Uh, and it, it is part of artificial intelligence. But today, the technology is much more advanced. And as Clara mentioned, that uh, many uh, libraries are using digital assistants to do these kind of things. Like, you know, because if you have rules, OK, cataloging is about rules. What rules do you use? These would be great for, you know, programming. The, uh, the digital assistant, for example, to, to do the classification or use possibly machine learning, you know, because for sure it's going to use some of that. So um, again, you know, look for um, programs available, you know, through the internet, um, classifications, uh, you know, like um, uh, automatic classification. Um, so uh, yes, connect ALA. Thanks, Clara. Yeah. So there are different ones available. Okay, and uh, we have here from uh, and this Ahmed Matar. He said that in Midad, which is related to Nasir, there is a model for uh, using AI in cataloging. So I think here in the region there is some effort, successful one. Um, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think this is uh, splitting this question between you and. Uh, Clara, as well, it's about uh, the, educate, the education uh, in uh, library schools and also uh, how to see the programs for teaching uh, this technology, especially the AI. Well, so, so far, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, That's I was fine. just going That's to fine. say uh, that <laughs> there are some uh, LIS schools already uh, teaching this. Uh, but what we have recognized, and uh, Dania is going to do a study on this, uh, we have recognized that they have focused mainly on the technological part, how to create the solution, and not always the ethical and social aspects. And uh, so what we want to do as a team with Sue is contribute to the discussion of how do we develop uh, the curriculum in our LIS programs. And so we uh, will be uh, presenting at the I conference um, and uh, the context will be not only what we have learned so far in the curriculum we have developed, but uh, Dania will be doing a, a survey of how LIS is taught, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence is taught in LIS schools. And don't feel bad, I just add, I know we're running out of time. Uh, if you're LIS, uh, library schools don't include AI, you're not alone. <laughs> because even in the US uh, and North America, uh, not all library schools have AI yet, um, or information or I schools have AI. They may have, some of them have specific aspect of AI, but not like a curriculum that for either the curriculum is technical, like a joint with computer science, but not for people who want to get you know, to be conversant with AI, to understand the issues surrounding AI, and, and so forth. Perfect. Thank you. We have one last question, because I know that you're, you're uh, almost out of time, and we uh, uh, encourage all attendees just to send the question over the email. Um, the last question, it's um, try to figure it out. Yes, it's uh, about that fish and is useful in the... Um, here we go, sorry, I, I missed it because there is scrolling. Okay. Um, how, how can we, okay. Okay, this one, we can just, because most of the questions that we already 
past it before. Um, how can to add the artificial intelligence in library science curriculum? This is you already just answering, but here, what would be done for other librarians and information specialists to be trained on artificial intelligence? So I think this is one to prepare the librarian not to lose their job, if you say that. Uh, what Clara mentioned this that train? already. No, uh, no, no, I'm just what... kidding, but actually they have to get yeah. more skills. So what is the suggestion from your side and Clara about the training needed for the librarian to face this future? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Clara. Clara. So uh, one would be to identify where you can get the training. So one mm -hmm. is the IDEA Institute. Uh, the conferences that you can attend can introduce you, but then they won't actually teach you. And so then, you know, if you can find courses being offered in LIS programs, uh, ask your local uh, National Library Association to develop a program and they can get in touch with us on how one might go about doing that. But uh, take uh, steps to organize yourselves and um, ask for information and ask for this kind of knowledge to be uh, provided. Yeah. Okay, Dania. Um, the same thing. The you know, it's it's. I, I know it's different in the uh, in the in that region in the Middle East region than it is in the United States. But uh, for any opportunity, uh, for example, the Lebanese Library Association, we talked about. Uh, we don't provide, uh, by the way, the same presentation. Uh, it, it's evolving over time. So there is a lot of update and new things that we include as we are invited to speak uh, about AI. Uh, is that uh, keep up with the readings, you know, find some readings, uh, basic readings uh, about AI, uh, and then move, you know, to see what in the area, in the region, what is provided, who's doing what about AI. Um, like, you know, when I explored some research, for example, I found that uh, that research study that I mentioned. And if you have access to webinars that are provided through associations, such as ACES, okay? Because once we have the Middle East chapter, um, we have 28 members now, but we want more from every country in the Middle East. Once we have that, uh, we uh, may provide a webinar, uh, like two hours or so, uh, training, uh, you know, for Middle East countries about AI. So that would be a good bridge between what you have access to now in, in the Middle East and also what we can do here as part of ACES Middle East chapter. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, the partnership between uh, Nasija Academy and the Mortensen <coughs> Center and uh, developing such uh, uh, special uh, webinar is a, is a step on the road to uh, give the awareness for the uh, attendees in the region and also adjust a piece of the whole uh, picture. It's need a lot of effort from the attendees themselves. They can follow the uh, uh, library associations in different countries. And also they have to start from uh, their uh, uh, point. As we said, they have to know uh, more about themselves and skills. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank you so much, Professor Clara, Professor Dania, and uh, also we thank the attendees for uh, attending this webinar. Uh, we do appreciate the time and effort you spend to be with us. And for sure, we are looking to have you again in another uh, uh, topic in the library and information science. Thank you. And I leave the last uh, uh, word for you, Clara and Daniel. So uh, on behalf of our team to uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah, and thank uh, Mr. Saeed for the opportunity to be able to share our knowledge as well as information about our institute. Thank you. Thank you, Dania. Yes, same yep. thing. Thank you so much uh, for this. This is the first time I talk at Nasij, uh, you know, Academy. Uh, I enjoyed it. And thank you all uh, for attending this uh, this webinar. Uh, it's been it's well organized. And please stay in touch. If you have any questions, you may um, contact us directly or you can also ask Dr. Abdullah uh, and he can contact us. Uh, but, you know, we're very humble people. 
So if you email us, you need suggestions, we will answer you. <laughs> we will give you the information. There you go. There you go. Thank you so much again, and uh, wish you, you uh, having a lovely holiday there um, to Thank the you. end of the year. So we have that uh, the coming year will be better than the one that we are closing up and uh, uh, have a nice uh, night for all the people in the region here from the attendees. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.